Awesome. Thanks, everyone. How's everyone doing today? So any hangovers from the dry farm wines yesterday? That's the burning <laughs> question I want to get the answer to. Um, terrific. Well, thanks so much for coming out. Let's get a sense of really who's in the room. How many sort of docs or practitioners do we have? Hands in the air. People, okay, people that are uh, strength coaches or work nutrition trainers, people who are here to improve their health. Awesome. Terrific. Well, um, today we're going to talk about some things that for myself, um, going through school and university as well as my naturopathy degree, this idea of ancestral health really became a keystone of how I practice. So, so today we're going to do a brief introduction to that. We're going to look at a basketball player, a football player, and, and gymnast, and how this sort of ancestral template fits in. And some of these themes, um, which are which permeate through sports, nutrition, and performance, but which for me, in my bias, is that they are really ancestral themes. So to kick things off here, I mean, for myself, I actually did my undergrad up the road at UBC, University of British Columbia in Vancouver. 2000-2001, uh, graduated, was going to get into medicine, and I had some health complications playing sport and whatnot and some digestive issues, so I thought to myself, well, I'm going to go into medicine, I want to you know, really be able to tie in nutrition in these things, and I was going around campus asking the the docs in the medical school about how nutrition connected with medicine and of course wasn't very much so I was a little disillusioned went over to the strength and conditioning side it was sort of the same idea you know nutrition digestion all these things were very siloed um, so as you do at that time I just decided well I'll take some time off you know do the backpacking thing I, I ended up traveling various countries and working as a trainer in the UK um, and I was amazed as a personal trainer you know, working with diet, working with exercise, working with lifestyle modifications, all the benefits that we could give folks um, just in terms of general health. So for me, 2006, that circled back for me going back to 2005, 2006 to naturopathic medical school. And this is where it was really cool because now in the online world with blogs and podcasts and everything else, it seemed like a lot of other folks were connecting these dots and it was a you know, much bigger community. Um, and so when I looked at, you know, the definitions of the Ancestral Health Society, you know, we can see here, you know, to collaborate, to understand health challenges, phenomenal. And of course, motivated by a belief that evolution has much to teach us. And of course, in my opinion, I've added for athletic performance and recovery as well. Okay, so with that in mind, let's take a look at some of these case studies. The first is an NBA player with chronically low vitamin D status. Now, this is a player came to me, you know, several years with very low vitamin D levels. You see there, 10 nanograms per mil. You know, and flus, often um, missing time, practices, games, etc. Kind of guy who was always on the training table, right? The therapist would say this person is always struggling with no major injuries, but a lot of nagging stuff. And of course, his history as well, they dosed him up with a lot of high dose vitamin D over the years and, and not been able to have a shift. And of course, the question was well, African American player, you know, his genetic background have a role to play here. He was a you know, darker skin complexion as well. Is there some kind of disease process going on? You know, the medical staff had, had gone through and not seen anything, but is there something um, more profound going on? Did he actually have good nutritional status and was maybe using it up more effectively? Um, the real question was, did he have more? So before we jump into to that, let's take a step back and look at what vitamin D can do for athletic performance. And of course, this has to do with vitamin D status, right? And so things like increased muscular strength, increased force and power production, uh, re reduce recovery time, even VO2 max, as well as body composition. There's, all, there's a lot of associations with vitamin D status. The tricky part is that these are, there's conflicting uh, evidence in the research, right? Just by increasing someone's vitamin D status via supplementation, we don't see the associative increases in all these parameters. So what the heck's going on here? And how do we get to this deeper layer of sort of the root cause of in this case, this person's lower vitamin D status. So if we look at the metabolism of vitamin D, of course, from the sun, from our diet, or through supplementation, we get conversion uh, in the liver to 25-hydroxy, and of course, into the kidneys of 125-hydroxy, and that's that active form in circulation. So let's go back to our NBA player. What's going on? Well, let's get a look into their daily life. What, what do they do on a day-to-day -day basis? Well, most of the time, if you're on the road, you wake up in a hotel, all right, dark room, they have breakfast inside the hotel, they get into a um, bus, transport to a practice facility, again, inside all day long at the practice facility. Once they get treatment, they go back to the hotel. Inside again, if you just came from Dan's talk, fantastic, all about sleep, 
Um, they go for their afternoon nap, which is a nice thing. But of course, staying inside, games in the evening, so there's really a, a major lack of outdoor light. Um, and this is one of the central themes here of really getting back to just sleep and circadian rhythm, circadian biology. And we see that today, obviously, is hugely popular, but this is something that's definitely uh, deeply rooted um, in ancestral health. And so that was one of the first aspects. How do we get this player outside more? How do we get him exposed to more light? If we look a little bit deeper, we say, well, you know, after games practices, they're going back to the hotel. There's a lot of late night eating. Um, and most of the time, again, in terms of if they're going to deviate from their plan in terms of nutrition, you know, there's a lot of late night Oreos, late night treats, late night sugars. So again, a real mismatch to what in terms of our evolutionary process. And so how does this impact other areas of health? Well, when we look at things like blood sugar balance, this is a really sort of key component. And for this player, you know, things like HA1C, which is this three month average blood sugars, we can see, well, you know, it's, it's on the higher side, uh, but not, not picking up any red flags from the, from the traditional medical staff. Of course, if we dig a little bit deeper into things like fasting insulins and glucose, all of a sudden we see that there is something deeper going on. We also see things in terms of inflammatory issues with CRP levels being elevated. And of course, CRP is acute phase reactant. It's going to be uh, highly variable, but these are markers that have been done over, over time, right? Three, four times a year. And this is a player where we consistently see these patterns. And again, we're never taking things in isolation. We're not just taking biomarkers from the labs. It's also in conjunction with the symptoms that the, the athlete's presenting with, what the, the folks in the training table are seeing, and also what the coaches are seeing um, on the court. And so when we look at this idea, this connection with blood sugars and vitamin D, a lot of the research is done on, on white populations, but we see more now in terms of here's a black and white community dwelling adults, and there's strong associations between lower 25 hydroxy vitamin D and things like poor blood sugar control, insulin resistance, and inflammation. The really interesting thing here is that the, you know, this player was not obese by any means, was very lean and, and by physical inspection, you know, pretty much see a six pack, so everyone assumes when we see somebody that's that lean, we just assume a certain level of health. And this gets really interesting because when we dig further into how, and if you work with, with athletes or in your facility, if you're using you know, calipers versus bod pod versus DEXA scans, this is where you can start to see some real discrepancies. Um, Heather Sprenger is one of the head physiologists at the CSI, the Canadian Sport Institute on the East Coast in Toronto. Um, and at one of her talks a few years ago, she'd mentioned that you know, if, for a highly skilled uh, practitioner using calipers, it's typically about a 2% discrepancy to the bod pod and maybe about a 3% discrepancy to the DEXA scan. Because again, no matter how good you are at pinching um, subcutaneous fat, you cannot pinch between your liver and your kidneys, right? And so when you get into the DEXA scan, all of a sudden, if you're seeing certain players were with elevated levels of body fat, especially around the internal organs, this is where for this player, we were seeing a body fat percentage that was more like 128 uh, 13%, which is a, a marked difference. This is really interesting as well because there's uh, a few other docs um, in the UK and Australia, Dr. Daniel Plews and Paul Larson, that had some reported some findings in Ironman um, athletes with a similar um, connotations in terms of the athlete being looking very lean, but on further inspection, when we get into the DEXAs and whatnot, we're seeing actually much greater uh, visceral fat stores than what we would expect. And so again, all this goes back to this idea of, okay, well, what is this athlete eating? What's their diet look like? And so for this player, you know, this is a common thing that you find. I mean, egg white only breakfast. And this is when we start thinking back of the populations. And, you know, yesterday, you know, Daryl touched on it in the panel of, you know, depending on who your parents are and what kind of diets that they followed, all of a sudden in certain communities, if cholesterol is an issue, if heart disease is an issue, you know, Fearing the egg yolk is a big problem, and so you'll see often in these populations steering away from having things like the egg yolk. This player had, you know, very low intake of things like fish as well. Lower vitamin A status, didn't eat a lot of fruits and vegetables, definitely not a lot of orange colored vegetables as well. Um, we see a higher sugar and processed food, and of course, the late night eating was definitely really profound, especially late night sugars, which is, you tend to see a lot in athletes, professional athletes, as well as, you know, collegiate level athletes. Um, and of course, it's been cut off here, but the Lancet, when we look at vitamin D as more of a, we think that today it could be more of a biomarker for health and ill health. So is it telling us more about the state of the health of our athlete versus simply trying to correct the 
number we're seeing in our result. Simply trying to get that vitamin D back to you know, 30 to 40 nanograms per mil. So what did we do? Well, this is where you know, I think the art of coaching becomes really important if you're a primary care physician, especially your practitioner, um, definitely obviously if you're a coach, but being able to get your clients and the folks that you work with to be able to make changes. Right? We always assume that we can just provide people information and they will take up that information and do as we've told them. Um, and we see definitely in the mainstream medical model, this just isn't the case. Um, chronic disease, you know, 90% now diet, exercise, lifestyle based. Right? So what do we do? Well, in the mornings, we basically said, can you give me 20 to 30 minutes? So when you're on the road, rather than staying in your room and going down to the breakfast area in the hotel, I want you to get outside. You know, this player in particular liked to be updating, connecting with folks on social media or email and whatnot first thing in the morning. Anyway, he was doing it lying in his bed. Why don't we just get him outside, um, whether it's on a patio, balcony, etc. When he was at home, he, he lived in a very temperate climate, so there was lots of sun. So we said, hey, get outside, no shirt, do your morning catch-ups, um, you know, catching up with emails, etc. for that time. So he got outside in the morning as well as the midday. And this was a really key one as well, walking home from practice. He didn't live far from the facility. You can't always do this when you're on the road, but the same idea, tank top. Um, getting more just daily sun exposure, because again, this player would need quite a lot uh, from a day to day. and was really getting you know, almost less than 30 minutes of outdoor exposure. When we look at the diet, is adding very simple things in, adding egg yolks back to the diet. Um, a lot, like a lot of professional athletes, having access to a personal chef makes things, can make things a lot, heck of a lot easier when you just say, okay, we want to put more of these back into the diet. So mushrooms and the omelets in the morning, adding back the egg yolks. He was amenable. We went through various options. You can see the vitamin D rich foods there in the bottom. We went through different options that he would and wouldn't do. And I think this is a really important conversation to have with your clients or your athletes. You know, you can give them a list of foods and I think this is sort of the classic method that we would typically do and um, dietitians, et cetera, just handing out a sheet of foods that are high in that. Well, if the person's not gonna eat them, then, then what good does that really serve, right? And so we managed to find, to nail down some options for him. So we did, you know, increase status that way as well. We added in a, a supplement, um, you know, food source supplement from, from Norwegian cod liver oil versus just um, D, uh, vitamin D emulsified drops. And the big one here as well was the blood sugar control issue. Like rather than waking up in the morning and having copious amounts of juice, having pancakes with maple syrup, having um, cereals, granolas, etc., we had to, to monitor that and switch that. And he was obviously better when he was at home and someone was preparing his food, but on the road, this is when, again, if you don't teach that behavior piece, if you don't develop those habits in the person, they're always going to revert back to uh, what they'd done previously. We also increased his protein intake at, all across the board. Uh, I think that's a classic one, especially whether it's recreational athletes, elite professional athletes. As the seasons go on, as stress goes up, they naturally start to reduce their, their intake of foods. Uh, most of the time, they don't perceive it. Oftentimes, the coaches and therapists don't perceive it, but that's a really big one, especially for things like immunity and recovery. And around the sugar consumption, I mean, it's really difficult to make someone who eats a lot of sugar to convert them overnight to someone who doesn't eat a lot of sugar. So we sort of bargained a little bit halfway of trying to remove it as best we could in the late night and just placing it more pre-practice, pre uh, during practice, these areas where we're just gonna be using glucose anyway and as a way to kind of change behavior. So that was, again, another strategy that he was, he decided he was okay with that. Um, oops. And so in terms of results, this was, you know, surprising even for myself. This was 12 weeks on, you know, from the end of the off season, end of the season to throughout the off season to the start of the season, you know, his vitamin D status came up double. And of course, the tricky part when you're working in real time is, was it the sun exposure outside? Was it the food? Was it the supplement? Um, and of course, in performance, uh, you know, outcome is the thing that matters most. And so it would be great to circle back and figure out how we can nail down the right approach. But the beauty of an ancestral approach and sort of a functional approach is we want to be drip feeding these changes in anyway, right? And so the outcome is really what we're after. And we saw, you know, in terms of inf inflammatory levels down, he also, during that season, had the least amount of gains in this. So we were able to, to maintain a lot of these habits throughout the year, which was, which was a big win and a big win for the staff. And it comes back to this second theme for me, which is, you know, human first. For a lot of these athletes who are genetically gifted, you know, especially in sports nutrition, sports supplementation, we're always looking for that thing that we're going to give them that's going to give them that extra 5% or 10%. 
well, if you have an athlete who has a 44 inch vertical and they're the fastest player on the court, do you really need to give them anything that's going to enhance their physical capacity in that sense? Or do you just need to make them a healthy person to then allow them to use their natural gifts, to keep them from getting sick, to keep them from getting run down? And I think this is a big theme that's come across now in, in human performance is this idea of human first and just creating healthy people and therefore allowing them to perform at the best. Terrific, the next one was a football player, um, African American as well, offensive lineman getting towards the end of his career, the classic sort of chronic knee, chronic shoulder, chronic elbow pain, um, had weight gain over the last few seasons, so was playing at a heavier weight uh, than he normally would be playing at. And he was, you know, considering retirement, wondering what he was gonna, wondering what he was gonna do, but decided he wanted to give it one last shot in terms of trying to tweak his nutrition uh, training to be able to reduce some of that discomfort and pain, as well as just to, to get leaner. So we see here, you know, depending on where you play, you know, 324 for an offensive lineman might not be too heavy, but for him that was on the heavier side. Body fat percentage, 24%, but a lot of these concomitant things that you tend to see with people with significant abdominal adiposity, and whether it's in clinical practice or again with athletes, and this is especially to athletes who are playing sports where there's the you know bigger in terms of size so rugby players shot putters football players because we know as we get greater abdominal adiposity things change in terms of gut microbiota things change in terms of total inflammatory response which we'll we'll get into here but his clinical presentation wasn't too dissimilar from the previous um, case study really high inflammatory levels again ha1c doesn't look that bad initially but when you look deeper into the insulin function and the home IR, we're seeing again, you know, just a reflection that his dietary choices aren't meeting uh, what he really needs, right? Uh, again, low vitamin D status as well. Okay, and this is a football player, so he's actually spending a lot of time outside, right? Again, that first example is really a classic one if you think of athletes who play indoor sports, whether it's basketball players, hockey players, gymnasts, people who spend their day, you know, like us inside a room, then it's gonna be definitely be on the lower side. GGT is a liver enzyme. It's one of those ones. Has anyone seen Super Size Me? Yeah. yeah. After they, uh, you know, he gets his, decides he's going to eat McDonald's for 30 days and gets his blood, um, gets his blood test done. A couple weeks later, goes back in to see his doc, and the doc's eyes almost pop out of his head because he's looking at the liver enzymes, and they're through the roof, and he's worried for this guy's health and safety, right? Um, and so GGT is definitely a marker as we're over-consuming. Uh, calories and carbohydrates and sugars, we're going to see that elevation there. And that normally is a, happens before we even see changes in things like you know, insulin and the HA1Cs. So this theme here, the third theme for me is this idea of periodized nutrition. You know, throughout history we would have had moments where we ate a little bit less or a little bit more. Um, now as Dr. Cordain rightly pointed out to me, you know, hunter-gatherers were very skilled at getting food, so it's not like they were starving, but there was definitely fluctuations in terms of intake. And when we look at just definitions, if we look at what is periodization, so Dr. Brad Schoenfeld is a heavyweight in the research of strength and conditioning. You know, periodization is a general concept. It's not this rigid or defined method. And the essence of periodization is to manipulate training variables to optimize a fitness outcome. And so the cool part is that we can also do this in nutrition. And so periodized nutrition, which is something that, again, in sport and in bodybuilding and various things has been used without this title for, for many, many years, but it's now something that's definitely well recognized in the literature, Asker Yukendrup. Um, this refers to a strategic uh, combined use of exercise and nutrition, right? To, to maximize a fitness goal or a body composition goal. And so for me, seeing this in clinical practice with, again, rugby players, football players, heavier hockey players, shot putters, this idea of having periods where we're gonna start to change the intake. Because these people are so used to being heavier, and there's a lot of pressure as well, depending on the coaching staff, um, to have their players meet a certain requirement. Right? They want their linemen to be a certain weight, regardless of even if they're slowing down, if they're less powerful, etc. So what's one of the problems? Well, one of the problems is the sort of cafeteria diet, which uh, Dr. Sven Guinez obviously talks so well about, and all the mechanisms behind why we choose to overconsume. But this is one of the issues, right? This is where the players are eating all day long. And of course, in the off season, there's no real off season for the consumption because what happens in the off season is they don't go into a caloric deficit. We get into even more of a caloric surplus as they get to take some time off, which is going to exacerbate a lot of the things that we saw. Because as we look at the research, you know, the more belly fat we're holding on to, we see increases in fasting insulin. We see increases in inflammatory markers like CRP and IL-6. We see increased likelihood of zonulin dysfunction, that key marker that helps to promote a gut, strong gut. Uh, barrier function, um, 
And of course, we get a change in the microbiota. So as you see with your clients, as there's more abdominal adiposity, we know that there's gonna be changes in terms of the healthy gut microbiome, um, more dysfunction, more dysbiosis. You know, the acquisition of what's called a Western microbiome, which, which alters the metabolic capacity and, and aggravates these inflammatory responses. And of course, strong relationship with things that whenever players are trying to maintain size, they, they, they effectively end up deviating to, which is things like bread, cereals, processed carbs, the things that they find in the cafeteria setting where they're training to just get enough calories in through the day. And so, again, for me, this fourth theme is this idea of just a healthy gut microbiota. And this is also a bit like vitamin D, rather than trying to manipulate the microbiota of just saying, well, this is another general marker that tells me about the overall status of the person. And so we're, we're starting to see if we see low vitamin D status, if we start to see more uh, altered uh, microbiota markers, we're just basically telling us back to that human first model, this person is not consuming the right nutritional approach or there's some real gaps in what they're doing uh, in terms of the tailored approach. So what do we do? Well, this is where, you know, I try to stay away from labels and, and, and defining diets. I think if you work with various other groups, whether it's dietitians, docs, anyone else, these labels, as we know, can be really limiting. You know, for some people, the word paleo, which I'm sure for a lot of us in this room, is something that's really um, motivating and positive. In other rooms, it would be not that. It would be, could be the opposite. So things like low carb, things like keto as well. Um, trying to stay away from that and even using this umbrella term of periodized nutrition, because ironically, everyone can agree on that. But if we start using other terms, people tend to immediately uh, get into some kind of pre-existing bias that they already have, which I find creates a lot of roadblocks uh, even though we're all trying to get to the same destination, which is to improve the player's outcome. So for this player, it was pretty straightforward. I mean, we're reducing a lot of the, the processed carbohydrates and sugars, some of the complex carbohydrates, um, increasing his overall fat intake. And his training in the off-season was two-a-day training, so doing HIIT training in the morning, lifting in the afternoon. So there was periods of you know, sleep low strategies where we would reduce carbohydrate after the PM session and not provide any in the morning. Um, nothing too exotic, but quite straightforward to help improve uh, body composition and see if we could get some reductions in, in inflammation and pain. So again, what did we swap out? Nothing, you know, for people into this room, nothing that's too um, striking. Again, cereals, pancakes, toast. A lot of the pre-workout formulas that were just, you know, 40 grams of maltodextrin every time, you know, do we need some of these things? The caffeine, the amounts of caffeine. I think a lot of um, players don't realize that they're, if they're having a venti or a trayenta at Starbucks, and then also adding on top of that their two, three, 400 milligrams in their pre-workout, just how much caffeine they're getting. Uh, and we're seeing a lot of really cool research in the nutrigenomics world around caffeine intake and performance. And there's a group of ultra slow metabolizers, which is about 10% of the population that actually get performance uh, decrements or decreases from caffeine, from modest amounts of caffeine. So that's again, an area of sort of personalized or precision nutrition where we can start to figure out um, if that's an, a negative for your athlete. So again, for this individual, you know, responded really well, weight came flying down so much. Again, the coaches were a little concerned, body fat came down, he had reductions in pain. Um, but again, something that you, I'm sure if you're a coach or nutritionist out there, you see this a lot in endurance athletes as well. We start to get into this idea of periodized nutrition um, and changing the, the amount of sugars. We start to see a lot of improvements around GI function. So just, we, we move away from this constant state of chronic gas, bloating, discomfort, uh, and players just feel better, right? We also see a lot of improvements in sleep quality. So this is someone who used a CPAP machine, you know, by the, by the end of the off season, he's barely using a CPAP machine and sleeping, you know, sleep quality had improved markedly. So, you know, for this player actually when we, and here's his lab results here as well, so again, decreases in all these things. And these are effective if you are working with medical staff or medical teams, because when they see markers like this improving, then all of a sudden, you know, the, the therapies or the nutritional changes that you're making have got a little bit more to stand on as well. His playing weight, he actually came up to about 310, 312, um, but maintained a lot of the improvements that he'd seen in joint function. So in terms of that nagging shoulder, nagging knees, you know, it was a lot better. And he's actually still in the league, and this is third year from, from when, when we saw him. So again, you know, without a lot of buy-in from the player, I try to, whether I'm in regular practice with my patients or with athletes, we're always trying to, how little do they have to do to get the maximum amount of gain? And I think that's where a lot of these ancestral themes are fantastic because if we can convince people to do these things, uh, they're very modest in terms of the buy-in, but we can get a lot of great uh, outcomes as well.
Awesome, the last one here is definitely something that uh, is new to me. Uh, as a dad with two girls under four, um, nutrition for, for women, nutrition for sport is definitely something that's become more to the forefront. Um, you could associate this with youth in general, but it will, this will be more related to, to female uh, athletes as well. And this idea of just nutrient deficiency. Um, I'm sure you're all familiar with What the Health, documentary on Netflix, and this is you know in an era of misinformation or, or fake news. This is really tricky because most athletes, uh, and even at Canada Basketball, I mean, I, we do the nutrition, I do the nutrition for our Olympic team, but it goes all the way down to our youth, so 13 year olds. Um, and this is actually something, again, that was mentioned in the panel yesterday, is that you know, we, in, in instructing the 13, 14, 15 year olds, we get their parents in as well. And so we start to get this trickle down effect of a lot of these notions around cholesterol and saturated fat, and we get to the source, which is again, the parents and whatnot, but, but a lot of young people now are seeing this information and this is what they're running with. Um, and so it creates a scenario where nutrient deficiency is much more likely. And of course, this is a very common one that we're all familiar with, but this ancestral theme of nutrient density, and this is sometimes where I really struggle with a classical um, dietetics approach to things, is that we almost, it doesn't seem like we care where things are coming from. If you attended Ben Lynch's talk this morning, there, there doesn't seem to be any discrepancy between the folic acid from their cereal versus what they might get from uh, which for me is a little bit irritating. Um, so we see here things like iron and zinc, obviously really important iron is, is very obvious in terms of energy levels, training, recovery, hemoglobin, myoglobin, electron transport chain, energy levels, just massively important. Uh, but zinc as well, for not only immunity, recovery, but we're seeing, which I'll get to in a minute here, things around you know, eating disorders, which is really, really compelling. Symptoms that you're gonna see in your you know, athletes, are, they're very general, they're tricky to pick up because things like fatigue, poor recovery, frequent infections, I mean, any athlete training intensely can have a lot of these symptoms, right? Um, altered menses, et cetera. The thing that I think we can, as a, you know, practitioners, trainers, nutritionists, doc, is, is just start to change the, the mindset. Most young athletes, you know, you're gonna get up in the morning, they're gonna have a bowl of cereal, they're gonna have a couple granola bars for the day, they're gonna have a sandwich, and they're gonna have a a bowl of pasta for dinner, and all of a sudden we think, well, wait a minute, what's going on with the amount of nutrients that we're able to get in, especially these key minerals? You know, coffee, caffeine intake, I'm a big coffee fan, but obviously too, you can get too much of a good thing. Uh, and of course, decrease in animal protein. And protein intake overall is definitely something that, just in terms of immunity, recovery is so critical for, for young athletes especially, and it's something that's definitely lacking, as well as things like red meat, seafood, Organ meats is another story. I mean, that's very low intake, uh, if any at all. And so chicken ends up being kind of the primary, uh, primary source. Now, what really blew me away was a few years ago, Dr. James Greenblatt, who runs an eating disorder clinic on the East Coast, had given a presentation at a medical conference. Um, and low zinc status was something that came out for them on multiple eating disorders. And when I had a chance to chat with him after the conference, he had mentioned that effectively, if all they do is correct for zinc status, they have significant improvements in whether it's anorexias, bulimias, et cetera. And so for me, again, with this ancestral template and this idea of we're just the grain-based consumption that we see in, in younger athletes of processed food, it's just such an easy win to help fix a lot of this stuff. And in sports like gymnastics, where there's a heavy, heavy pressure on body composition, um, it becomes really, really significant. And it's something that's not emphasized really that much in a, in a traditional setting. So it's another area that I think we can really uh, move the needle. I think I'm getting a little behind on time here, but again, the traditional would just be, oh, let's slap an iron supplement on, or we'll do a ferritin only test versus being more um, methodical in terms of how we run full iron panels, et cetera. And of course, at the end of the day, the solution's really straightforward, right? Like, let's get more um, of these animal proteins, healthy animal proteins in. Let's also, as best we can, try to reduce the intakes, and again, work with the person in front of you, right? You've gotta push them just beyond their capacity. It's the same thing in the gym. If they just walked in, you wouldn't give them a one RM for a 400 pound deadlift. Don't throw five, six, seven, eight things at them at once, right? Drip feed the changes in, create new habits in, in your athletes and your clients, and then you'll get some real sustained, uh, sustained benefit. So for me, these have been you know, the big rocks for my clinical practice. You know, diet, exercise, lifestyle, these ancestral themes are, are massive. I think from, a, from an athletic standpoint as well, uh, these themes are, and there's many more as well on the ancestral side, but these are really fundamental themes and you're actually seeing them in, in performance nutrition. Um, I don't think as many folks relate them to this ancestral theme, but again, 
you know, my bias is definitely that they're steep, deeply rooted in, uh, in ancestral health. Awesome. Well, if you uh, enjoyed the talk, check out my podcast. I actually just had Dan Party on talking all sleep and circadian biology, so you can, you can check that out. Um, my book, The Paleo Project, as well. We actually, if you, um, if you shoot me an email, we don't have any books here, but if you, sh if you reach out to me there, infodrbubs.com, we've got a whole bunch of ebook, free ebook versions of it, so just shoot me an email. We'll give you a little, little swag for coming to the conference. We'll give you a copy of the book as well. And of course, you can reach out drbubs.com and on social media at drbubs. Awesome. Thanks so much for your time. Nice job catching up in the end there. You finished right on time. Okay. <laughs> we do have some time for questions. There's a mic over there you can line up at. Or if you're on this side of the room, raise your hand. I can bring you the mic. We'll take a question over here first while that's getting set up. Uh, I just want to sh share with you a success story. I'm not a doctor, but I know paleo. And I convinced a uh, Italian woman athlete to go to paleo. She was eating healthy, but she wasn't paleo. She went to paleo and low carb, except right after training. She only did her carbs during... Uh, right after training, the, all her other meals were low carb. Anyway, she <coughs> went on, she's cross country skier to make the Olympic team at 45. Fantastic. She went to the Olympics and was the oldest competitor there. And she uh, attributes her change and her success to low carb paleo. And that's a great remark in terms of, I mean, a great remark to longevity, which is sort of a key piece to this as well. And I think it's really key as well to know your athletes, like using those terms of paleo and low carb are, are fantastic. But if you do have a client that doesn't, doesn't resonate with, or you know they're working with a team, then again, call, call it by another name, but use the same strategies and you'll get those responses, right? Call it nutritional periodization. But fantastic. We have one over there. I think as people increase their workload, they're going to increase their hunger signals. Um, as, as they stay up later, as, as Dan so rightly mentioned, they, the, the caloric need, or the signal to eat more is also going to go up. Um, you know, focusing on, on protein is definitely is key. So getting in, again, knowing your client, whether it's shakes, whether it's jerky, whether it's meals, whether what, you know, finding those strategies that work for that person. I think it can also be used as a bit of a red flag. I know the Ironman athletes that I have or the triathletes that I have, that sort of scenario where they're walking home from work and they go by a corner store and they buy two bags of Twizzlers and knock back both of them is a good, is a good uh, red flag for the fact that they're not consuming enough caloric intake or you know, in terms of nervous system fatigue because that's definitely one that um, you'll see. And, and so you know, in terms of late night strategies, you know, finding the right foods for that person, but making sure that first off their meals are big enough and then frequent eating patterns through the day. Just as much as for myself in regular populations, I'm, I'm trying to get people away from snacking. It's just sort of an easier way to get back to three square meals. In athletic populations of you know, getting people to focus back on, on regular meals as well as regular snacks. Because you'd be surprised even in you know, NBA and professional basketball, there's these huge gaps in the day where they might go five, six hours sometimes without proper nu nutrition, which sounds um, counterintuitive. But, uh, but yeah, sorry if I can't give any... Uh, more specific answers than that, but hopefully that helps. Great, thanks. Do you yeah. have any strategies for um, people that have moral and ethical issues with meat? You know, like, so you'll have a lot of athletes who are like, oh, I want to get in shape, but you know, I'm a vegan or I'm a Seventh Day Adventist, right? Yeah, and so I, so I try to take the labels off of everything. I always tell my clients, first off, I'm just going to tell you what your body needs, and then we'll look at where it comes from first. Um, and all of a sudden, if we start to see, again, you typically you're just going to start to see all more animal protein and, and fats and everything else. And so we start to have that conversation around why are you doing what you're doing? Because a lot of people, um, 
you know, when I was at university, I was vegan. I was struggling with dairy. It was the late 90s. The internet had just been invented, or you know, first email account. Um, and so you felt a lot better. Um, but you keep going down that rabbit hole of now we're consuming a lot of grains and processed food. And so making that switch over to more of an ancestral primal, you know, helped me a lot. But this is where I think the conversation around just bringing it back around to what they need, why they're doing what they're doing. Because for a lot of folks who are just doing it for health reasons, and that's when we can start to say, well, here's all your biomarkers. Here's what you're experiencing. Like, you're not in good health. So we need to make, what are you willing to do? And I think as a natural human reason, Folks, like in a regular medical paradigm, it's just the doctor knows and they give the information to the patient and the patient's supposed to just absorb it. Um, but I think we need to have more of this communication style of, okay, well, let's, let's see what we can do. We need to have, you know, some ground beef or, or whatever else, like just trying to drip feed those changes in. Um, and a little bit of education around the fact that they're, you know, the f they're likely eating more processed food than they think. So you'll see a lot of the faux meats in the, in the diet of all of a sudden, if we're eating a fake sausage, a fake burger, and a fake steak for the day, so wait, again, what's the here? Um, and it, you'll see some, client, some athletes that'll just flip a switch and they'll be ready to jump, jump over. Others, you'll be able to feel that kind of resistance and you've just got to play the long game and say, well, okay, well, we need to change these biomarkers. We need to change how you're feeling. So let's, you know, what little things can we do now? And then slowly, because what tends to happen with those folks is once they start feeling better, all of a sudden the changes go that much more quickly and you end up getting to where you want to go without having to, to push that. But you got to let them make the decision. This is what I hear you saying to a certain extent. It's like a lot of things. You got to let the person feel like they came to it themselves right. versus saying, hey, this is a great thing. I want you to do this. And it gets back to that idea of coaching and, and reading all those great coaching books and how to kind of influence um, without just telling people what to do. When you say low carb, <laughs> uh, do you mean uh, cutting the complex carbohydrates out and including fruit? And you, I heard you mention also the second part of this question is you did include some sugars during workout or during um, their training. What kind of stuff are you including in that, if, if you don't mind sharing? Yeah, I mean, low carb is a general term. And again, you got to watch the terms you kind of use with athletes. But to give you an example, I had another client who was 375 pounds who was eating 800 grams of carbohydrate. So putting him on a diet that had 300 grams of carbohydrate was technically a relative low carb diet for him, right? So it's a general term in terms of, um, and, and most of the time, I mean, the reason why it works so well in general practice for things like diabetes is that it's such a simple message. Right? You reduce carbs, you basically get out all the processed food and all the sugar. So most of the time, you're going to get nice big drops in those areas. When we look at people who are more elite athletes, you know, carbohydrates become key for maintaining work output during exercise. You know, Mike Nelson here in the crowd, a phenomenal physiologist, will tell you first that you know, to maintain capacity is so key for their, the adaptations to exercise. So that's where then we start drip feeding in some fuel before exercise, where we can now take advantage of, of the fuel. Um, because the notion that just carbs are bad or carbs are evil, even that, sh you know, technically sugar, you know, if we're fueling training in terms of glucose, that's the primary fuel source. So just kind of strategically using it. Um, and again, in these circles, we kind of use those words like keto and low carb and everything else. But I would say if you, as you get more out in the general, you know, using terms like periodized nutrition, you end up talking about the same thing, but you get less uh, pushback from the folks that you're dealing with. 